Assalamu alaikum everybody. Welcome to our Ramadan live. I was having some uh, issues with connecting just now, but hopefully um, we'll have a smooth connection for the rest of this live. So I've been meaning to do this Ramadan live since before Ramadan and I've been eagerly, you know, planning it and waiting to do it. But unfortunately, as most of you probably know, with Ramadan, it's been super busy, especially where I am because I live in a madrasa. So we actually host the Tarawih and host the Iftar daily. So it's been super, super busy and, you know, fasting uh, until 7 p.m. in the evening is really difficult in a hot country like Ramadan. So it's been really difficult for me to actually come on here and be live. But I told myself it's better, you know, late than never. So although we're just entering the last 10 days of Ramadan, inshallah, this Ramadan live will be beneficial to uh, all of you and inshallah for the future Ramadans as well. So I'm going to be going live with uh, Nadia from Sajra Montessori. So let me just add her. Okay, I've just added her. So we'll wait for her to join. So um, there's been so many beautiful... Oh, assalamu alaikum. I can't hear you. Oh. Uh, oh, now I can hear you. Now I can hear you just okay. fine. So let me just readjust this because it's, hold on a second. There you go. That's better. So um, I was just saying that there's been so many wonderful things that have been shared on Instagram uh, for Ramadan. And um, it's really beautiful to see all the different ideas and posts and things that people are sharing. And what we wanted to do in this life is to kind of talk about how you can apply the Montessori philosophy or kind of um, give that kind of holistic uh, Ramadan feel through using the Montessori principles. That's really what we want to focus on in this live. So inshallah, I hope that it's going to be beneficial for everybody out there. Um, and also, hopefully it's going to take away the pressure because I think one of the things that I noticed is that, you know, with Instagram, people share lots of things and there's lots of amazing, amazing ideas being shared but sometimes that adds pressure onto each one of us as individuals, pressures to decorate our house beautifully, pressures to, you know, make all these Ramadan activities and so on. And, and actually it doesn't, it doesn't need to be that, um, you know, we don't need to put ourselves under that pressure, right? Because that's not what Ramadan is about, right? So I've invited Nadia, who has, um, she used to be called the Absorbent Mum, but now she's changed her name to Shadra Montessori. And uh, Nadia has a two and a half year old, is that right? That's correct. Yes. So you've got one of those younger ones who's just kind of becoming aware of Ramadan. So it's really beautiful for you to share with us what you've been doing with him. And then, um, you know, you're also, you've just finished your Montessori training with NAMC. Yes. So that's lovely. So we can bring that in as well. We can talk about that. Do you want to tell us a bit about yourself? Sure. Um, so as Naseva mentioned, oh, first of all, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, as uh, Naseva mentioned, I have a two and a half year old. I'm first and foremost a mother. And uh, secondly, I am a teacher. I have my uh, Bachelor of Education degree. I'm also currently doing my master's in second language acquisition. And uh, just for fun, I decided, you know what, why not throw in some Montessori training in that? So Alhamdulillah, I was able to finish just last week. Um, it was an uh, amazing opportunity. I've learned quite a bit. Uh, and inshallah, I'm also hoping to take uh, Naseva's course, hopefully soon. All right. <laughs> uh, about Montessori. I'm uh, Naseva is so um, knowledgeable, mashallah, that I'm really hoping to add that into the mix as well. Um, uh, so you're actually, you were already a teacher, right? And then you discovered Montessori later on. So do you want to share with us about how you discovered Montessori? Sure, of course. So while I was on maternity leave, um, I was, I, I've been a teacher for about seven, eight years now. Um, you know, I was just trying to way, like, trying to find a way at home to keep my child engaged. Um, I just found that before discovering Montessori, we would receive a lot of gifts that were just, you know, press buttons and lights and this and that. And he wasn't really feeling engaged in anything. I just found that everything was forced upon him. I wasn't able to understand him. He obviously couldn't communicate with me. Uh, and I was getting frustrated. So I decided to just do a bit of research, find some activities online. And I just happened to stumble upon a YouTube channel. I'm sure some of you may be aware of um, Hapa, Hapa Family Vlog. She's on YouTube. 
and she beautifully describes um, the Montessori method. She shows the day-to-day -day life of how you can integrate Montessori holistically in very simple ways. It doesn't have to cost you a lot of money. It's a very natural approach. And I really like that. Um, it was nothing that I had ever experienced in the school system prior to that. So um, after that, I actually started doing research papers in my master's um, integrating Montessori. And then I was like, you know what? I have to do it now myself. It's just, you know, I have to give it some justice. Um, and then here we are today. I have my Instagram where I share some activities and some, and some of our own lifestyle of how we integrate Montessori. And then now Lovely. with you, Humbel. Great. Lovely, mashallah. I think one of the things is a lot of um, parents, once they have their children, even if they have a background of education, once they have their children, they kind of begin to realize that, you know, those kind of like uh, the, the pressure, the academic pressure that's put on children and, you know, the kind of style of, um, you know, let's say toys with lots of lights or all of the, you know, you know, the worksheets and workbooks, they kind of realize that that's not actually what engages their child. So a lot of parents, you know, when they have their own children, they begin thinking, well, what can I do? You know, what, what can I do to engage my child and, you know, help them with their development, but at the same time, be something that they're attracted to and they want to do. And that's how a lot of people come to Montessori. And I love that you said that, um, you know, you were inspired by the HAPA um, blog and on there, uh, you know, it's quite simple how she implements Montessori. And again, I think it goes back to that thing that it's not about pressurizing yourself. Like we just said about Ramadan, it's not about pressurizing yourself. It's not get, about going out, buying all the materials and setting up a, you know, a classroom at home. No, the classroom is for the classroom. You know, that's for, you know, when your child goes to the classroom, but actually those Montessori principles, they're, they're, they're significant to our life before they are significant to the classroom. So mm -hmm. we can implement them in every aspect of our life at home. And that's why so many people like yourself and many others that are joining us now, you know, fall in love with Montessori, right? And I guess as you read about Montessori, did you begin to see that um, there's a connection between Islam and Montessori? Did you naturally see that connection as you were reading about Montessori? Definitely, I, I completely agree. Um, one thing that really stuck with me um, is I, I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing, but um, I believe it's a hadith of the prophet where he says that the first seven years play with your children and then from there you teach and then become, uh, it becomes more disciplined. And that really, really stuck with me uh, in that in Montessori, play is a work of the child. So I made that yeah. very early on. Yeah. yeah. That could be, you know, you're following your child's lead. You're, the pressure is off of both you and your child. And uh, you'll find that once you do that, you're not only following what Islamically you're supposed to be doing with children, but also, you know, you're integrating Montessori. So that's really what was the connecting factor for me. Yeah. And I think that as people read more about Montessori, um, as you get past those pretty pictures of the perfect shells and, you know, all of the beautiful resources, once you kind of get past that and you go and you begin to read into the philosophy that you begin to see that Montessori education is, it's all about the inner work, right? The inner work of the adult, the spiritual preparation of the adult, Definitely. the spiritual development of the adult. And also, you know, you know, Montessori tells us that we cannot make the child learn something. You know, we cannot, you know, make that development happen. It's an internal development that takes place. So Montessori is all about that internal development, that internal change in the adult, that internal development in the child. And that in itself is very um, connected to our faith as Muslims, because in Islam, it's totally about your spiritual and internal development. It, you know, it might outwardly look like Islam is about the way you dress or, you know, going to the mosque and so on. But, you know, the core of Islam is about that spiritual development that you have inside you. So as lots of Muslims begin to read about Montessori, begin to, um, uh, connect to Montessori's philosophy and read her books, it's almost like it's echoing what we've been uh, learning about our faith is mm -hmm. being echoed by Maria Montessori. And it's, it's incredible. You know, sometimes I look at something and I think, was it Maria Montessori who said it? Or was it like some like, you know, scholar who said it? You know, sometimes it echoes and you just think, wow. And, and the reason that that connection is so strong um, and you see that 
um, you, you know, you see that perfect alignment between Islam and Montessori is because Montessori is all about going back to the natural development of, of the child, going back to, you know, God's laws and God's plans for how the child will grow and develop, going back to the fitra of the child. And because it's all about the fitra of the child, of course, it's going to be in line with the prophetic teaching. Of course, it will be in line because the prophetic teaching is coming directly from God, you know, coming from Allah to the prophet, through the Quran. And we see it through the example of the prophet in the Hadith and so on. So it, it's all going to be the same. And I think this really, for all of us um, who join this Montessori, um, you know, Islamic Montessori movement, for all of us, we begin to see that, you know, there's a perfect alignment and it makes us not only excited, but it kind of gives us this kind of like sigh of relief that we've found now how to do it. You know, we've found how to nurture our child according to our deen, but at the same time, allowing them to develop to their full capacity and being in line with prophetic teachings. So that's, I think, one thing that a lot of people come to as they go through uh, the Montessori philosophy, they see those deep connections. And that's really something that we want to um, continuously bring up in all of these live sessions, because a lot of people are asking me, you know, how does Islam and Montessori fit together? You know, how, what's the connection and how about, you know, there's so many questions that I get asked and it's actually really simple, right? I mean, as you've done your training, Nadia, I'm sure you've seen that it's, the connection is really simple. It's not something like difficult. It's there, but sometimes we're just not conscious of it until later on as we go deeper and deeper into Montessori, exactly. right? And um, just to sort of summarize that in, in bringing Maria Montessori into our conversation, just to connect everything that you said, is it, uh, is it possible if I could just read the quote that really resonated? Yes, so please actually, go ahead. And this is, um, and I know we have some, some um, audience who are not, we have an audience that's not just Muslim too. So I just find that this quote really resonates with uh, people universally. It's um, now religion itself is not something that has to be given to the child. It is not something that has to be taught. Men have been religious since the very beginning of their history. Every race of men, however primitive, has had a language and a religion. We, knew, we know, therefore, that a sense of God exists within the heart of the child. It is not conscious, but it is there, and it cannot be lost, though it may be obstructed and distorted. It is something that has to grow, and it grows slowly. The important thing is to not interfere, for the plant will not grow if the buds are broken by clumsy and patient hand, handling. We must watch this plant carefully, give it the right conditions for growth and protection from cold and rough weather. But we must have patience while it grows in its own time and in its own way. That's incredible. <laughs> so incredible. Which book is that one from? So that from the God. Can... Say that again, sorry. I lost from that. God and the Child. God and the Child, yeah. Absolutely beautiful, right? Absolutely beautiful. Um, and I think that, you know, like maybe, you know, that kind of uh, Montessori's uh, connections of God and the Child, it, you know, it might be difficult to actually find those texts and I know that for me when I first started my Montessori journey it was really hard for me to actually find those but now thankfully there more of them are available yeah. and it's easier for us to actually read and then the more we read it the more we see how you know Montessori also spoke about the child's relationship with God right and uh, it's not a relationship that we force or that we make right we don't make that relationship it's naturally there within the child and this kind of brings us to the whole highlight of this um this talk which is about ramadan right you know because montessori is saying you know we don't it's not that we're forcing the child or we're trying to make the child connect to god they are naturally going to do that we just need to create that environment that allows them to develop and uh, develop their connection to god and strengthen their connection to god naturally without interference right because if we interfere what we're going to do is we're actually going to obstruct that natural process that's taking place um, but if we create that right environment it's going to flourish and i think ramadan is one of those things where you know for us as muslim ramadan is such a it's the highlight of the year you know it's like the month of the year where we spiritually change ourselves and we prepare ourselves and we, you know, we work on all those bad qualities that we have inside us, you know, and we improve ourselves so that we can have a new year ahead of us with a better, a better self. You know, we put our plans together. It's, it's kind of like that cleansing month, you know, 
to prepare us for the for the future 11 months that are coming and you know every 12 months we have a ramadan so we're in this constant cycle of being able to step back from the day-to-day -day life step, step back from that materialistic life and come come into our spiritual self and you know the way that ramadan is it really kind of takes us away we can't eat we can't do certain things and then we come away from all of that and we begin to like become more more spiritual and purify ourselves right and this is part of you know the cycle of a muslim and but how do we get the child to connect to this how do we make how do we help the child to be connected to ramadan and see the significance of ramadan and if we look online now there's so many you know wonderful activities and beautiful decorations and i'm not against any activities decorations i mean if you have the time and your children are interested go ahead but you know for me it's what is the actual the the root what's the the bottom line of how we connect the child to islam and i think that quote that you mentioned actually answers it right that quote that you mentioned actually brings to the forefront that it's not that we have to do something to the child it's not that we have to have lots of activities it's not that we have to you know make ramadan um fakely uh exciting or you know we don't need to turn it into a christmas you know <laughs> we don't need to like you know put all that effort into it you can if you have the time and you can if you want to because it's, it's nice it's nice to honor ramadan as a beautiful month but actually the most important thing is that for your child to have that life experience of ramadan so we all know that the the most important um, and the most potent moments of learning happen through real life experiences right we can all relate to that some real experience that we've had that's what's made the biggest impact on ourselves and to make ramadan the most meaningful and the most memorable to your child it's about giving them those life experiences those day-to-day -day life experiences of ramadan of the tradition of ramadan the culture of ramadan uh, you know giving them those life experiences in all the aspects of ramadan so that your child will totally absorb that especially those children who are below the age of six they will totally absorb it and Montessori tells us that whatever they absorb they incarnate in themselves and it becomes part of their personality so if you if you have that beautiful positive environment of ramadan your child is going to absorb that environment and it's going to become an integrated part of their personality so nadia share with us what you've done in your environment to try and help your child really take in the essence of ramadan definitely and i think a key word that i sort of um, use to summarize is uh, the, the prepared environment and i think the number one thing that I have to look at that is myself. I am also the prepared environment. Exactly, exactly. There's a quote sorry, that says that God prods and transforms the adult through the child. So, of course, having all these external things are great. However, first and foremost, I am the prepared environment that my child experiences first. So taking that into consideration, I looked at my own personal goals as a Muslim, and then I then manifested that in a simple goal that I had, which was, for example, what you see behind me. This is just a small portion of um, a prayer area. And this is something that I had in my mind for quite a long time in that, um, you know, nobody is perfect. You know, as a mother of a two and a half year old, sometimes you, you're, you're late for your prayers. Sometimes you, you know, like, things happen, you know what I mean? And I really wanted prayer to be central because Ramadan is all about your intentions. Ramadan is all about purifying yourself and bringing yourself back to what is important. So for me, I think prayer is the central thing that you should have in your home. Your home should revolve around prayer. Right. Your Ramadan should revolve around that and, and the Quran. So I decided to uh, create a uh, prayer area if I can just pick up the phone and I can maybe... Yeah, lovely. So, tour. <laughs> I'd love that. Yeah, um, show us. So, it's very simple. I didn't really do anything too, too elaborative, but we basically just created this outline of a, a mihrab. And a, a mihrab, for those who are not aware, is, um, sorry, is actually an indicator of the qibla. And I found that this was very important to have um, because 
obviously we're in the middle of a pandemic. I can't leave. I can't really go anywhere. My masjids are closed. So this is not only a visual reminder for myself, but it also um, is, a, is a visual reminder for my child who has never experienced this before, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so within our prayer area, we then have a uh, bookshelf. I find books are so amazing. Um, you know, I have tons of books related to Ramadan and just general books related to, you know, um, how to relate yourself to Allah and things like that. And then I have a, um, this is actually a bookshelf from Ikea. And this is what contains our um, John Mats as prayer mats and then the last one actually holds my hijab in there <laughs> oh, <lovely. laughs> organized has its own place and this is a permanent picture within my home i know a lot of people will create these ramadan corners um and then once ramadan is over it's gone right? it's gone, <laughs> it's gone. Uh, do you know the thing is in each one of our classrooms and i shared this with you when we had our um uh, when we had our discussion before our live, right? In each one of our classrooms, we have a little masjid area. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that really stood out to me when I came to Malaysia is that every corner of Malaysia, there's a surau, uh, like a masala, a small surau somewhere. So you, you can, there's always somewhere to pray. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, in order for it to be an integrated part of the child's life, you have to have it in your home. You have to have that little tiny corner which needs to be peaceful, which needs to be relaxing, where the child goes and they feel that sense of just, you know, calmness and tranquility in your home. You have to, and it's not hard. I mean, sometimes it's just simply having a beautiful rug or, you know, like, you know, putting a nice picture on the wall because a lot of people are in rental places, so they can't like, you know, paint on the wall or whatever it is, you know, or if you have the, if it's your own home, then you can put some beautiful tiles or something like that. So in each one of my classrooms, I always, um, put, put a prayer area and I've, I can't, I, I, I wish I knew how to share the photos on the live, but I think that this account doesn't allow me to share them. <laughs> does your account allow you to I, share photos? Yeah. Um, this mine does, so yeah, yeah. Mine is not coming up with the button. So, you know, so we have like a, a prayer area in each classroom because we want it to be that, you know, that salah, that prayer is, is a significant part of your day wherever you are whatever you're doing prayer is a significant part of the day and it's not just prayer for the actions of prayer and this is one thing that we have to remember when we are uh when we are the child is absorbing prayer it's not just about the actions but what we want them to absorb that prayer is giving thanks you know prayer is the the best way that you can show gratitude for the blessings that you've had so when we enter prayer, it's like we're entering saying, thank you, Allah, thank you, God, for the beautiful weather, for the lovely day, for, for our family, for our this, for our whatever. So having that, you know, the prayer area is in, in essence a place of gratitude, right? So we're connecting our children that, yes, you go throughout your day and you enjoy your day and you experience your day, but you are continuously in that state of gratitude. And, you know, you know, all of the, um, you know, so many people have, you know, spiritually aware people who are, you know, from different faiths and background will tell us that the highest level of emotion is gratitude, right? And for us as Muslims, we are called to gratitude five times a day in our prayer. We're called to face our Lord and thank him for, you know, the first thing that we say when we pray is Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, you know, all praise to the Lord of the universe. So we, you know, that's what prayer is about. So when you create that area in your home or you create that area in your classroom, you're creating that area that's always bringing your child that habit of always saying thank you, always recognizing and appreciating the gifts that we have in our daily life. And that habit, if the child absorbs us doing it, it might not be natural to us, but if we make it happen and we use that language, I want to thank my God now. You know, I want to say thank you to Allah. If we use that, our child is going to be that. Mm -hmm. We might have to act it, but they're not going to act it. They're going to be it. It's yeah. going to become an, they're going to incarnate it and it's going to go, become an integrated part of their um, personality. And, you know, Ramadan, it's like full of prayers full of prayers <laughs> you, know, you know we've got uh, where i am here they pray 22 rakas or tarawih 
So, uh, wait, yeah, 22 rakas of Torino. So it's like, wow. <laughs> you know, it's like, whoa. So very different from the eight that we prayed in England, you know. So uh, it's all about prayer. And uh, one of the most heartbreaking things that I saw growing up was seeing that when it came to prayer time, uh, children were not welcome in the mosque. I think yeah. this is something we still face today. Children yeah. are not welcomed in the mosque or children are told to be quiet during prayer or children are the parents rush to put their child to sleep so that while their child is soundly sleeping, they, they can pray their tarawih or, you know, they can read their Quran. And when we do that, the child is missing out. You know, the child is our future. They're the future generation. They're creating the man who they're going to become in the future. But we don't let them have that experience or it becomes negative experience because they're told to be quiet or they're told to sit still or they're told not to disturb you, right? And I, what I really love um, as I was reading your posts and talking to you, what I really love is that your child is part of your prayer. <laughs> you know, he's not separated from your prayer. He's part of your prayer. And that's what the prophet did. You know, there's a hadith where the prophet lengthened his prayer. Have you got that there? Yeah. I have <laughs> tell us, tell us the hadith. Um, so again, this is, um, I had to paraphrase because it was a little long, but the, there's a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was, um, oh, this is a different one. Sorry, give me one moment. Um, essentially, I'll just summarize it. It's somewhere in my notes, but essentially the Prophet was doing the evening prayer one day and, um, you know, uh, they were down in sujood and not everyone can really see what's happening either because if, if you're down in sujood, so yeah. after the prayer finished, uh, some people asked the Prophet, what happened? Like, did you get a revelation? Like, how come, you know, your, your sujood was so long? And the Prophet said, no, none of that. It was just that my, uh, my grandson was, you know, on top of me. And uh, I didn't want to disturb him. I wanted him to finish what he was doing before I came back up. So um, beautiful. Like, imagine that's the, the Prophet who has the best of prayers. And he lengthened his prayer for the sake of the child so that the child doesn't, the child can have that lovely, exciting feeling of Ramadan. And he let the child call on him. And there's also another narration uh, where the, the prophet shortened his prayer because mm -hmm. there was a child who was crying and he didn't want that child to be left crying, you know? So, I mean, this is the, the best of example, the best of creation, the prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam showing us that our prayer is not separate from the child. You know, the child, that means that children were brought to the mosque, you know? If you look in the seerah, children were in the mosque during the prayer time with their parents and with the prophet and the prophet catered for them. Mm -hmm. You know, he catered for them with love. So that's what we need to be creating. And we know that sometimes children are not welcome in, in the mosque, right? So we know that unfortunately, there are lots of mosques where children are not welcome. And, you know, sadly, there are even mosques where children are shouted at or children are, uh, you know, shamed if they're making noise. But actually, the child needs to be part of that. They need to experience it and it needs to be positive. So what you've done by creating that mosque area, especially in this pandemic, you know, and I love how simple it is. I mean, how did you do the design on the background? Was it with a... a so this was actually, um, I got a piece of cardboard. I had a big package that I had received one day and I simply just took the cardboard and I created half of this design, which is like the, I, I don't know what the design is called, but it's essentially like that half of the mihrab. And then all I did was I just traced that onto the wall and then I flipped it to do the opposite to make it symmetrical. And then these are actually um, these wooden tiles. I just had like one or two of them that I received from somewhere. And I just use that to create my design. And so simple. <laughs> if you are, I'm, I'm sure that you're, some of you may be Montessorians here. You can even use your metal insets. You can use it. Yeah, exactly. Shapes to actually create your design. You can even involve your children, which is probably the best thing to do in the creation of their masjid, right? Uh, yeah. Which I think is best, right? Because then they can decide, you know, what the colors are going to be like, what the design is going to be like. So keeping them at the forefront, I think is um, essential. And then of course, I'll just reach over and grab, uh, I have, which I'm sure a lot of people have as well, like a little child size um, prayer Pram. mat, obviously very beneficial because then they have their own personal space and Montessori Lovely. work mat. So this is the prayer mat. Um, I know Emily uh, Bears did a really interesting post about the relationship between those two, which is I think really fascinating. Uh, but one thing I also wanted to mention, which um, I didn't really make this connection until very last minute before our talk, was the first thing that we say in the child's ear when they're born is the adhan. 
Yes. Right? Yes. We are calling them to the prayer and then we make them leave, you know? So that is what we're supposed to be doing throughout yeah, our life. So we true. Prayer. And now is our opportunity to practically implement that in our homes and in our masjids, right? Yes. So similar to how, you know, in the prophet's example, where the, you know, grandchildren were climbing on top of him, like my child would often do that as well. You know, I was, I was the pickler triangle for him, right? I would go down, <laughs> oh, got to go back up, right? Um, but then I found that uh, an important thing to do is model in that sense of um, actually reading out loud. Um, again, we have the absorbent mind, you know, who's always listening to us. Yeah. And I found that, uh, and there's actually a verse in the Quran that says that um, in Surah Al-Isra, and offer your prayer neither aloud nor in a low voice, but follow a way between. So, you know, don't be too loud so that, you know, if they're working, you're disturbing them. But don't be too low either that they don't actually hear you. Let that absorbent mind be there to, okay, this is happening in the background. This is kind of like an invitation that, okay, I could go or I could do my own thing, right? But knowing that that is happening in the background, not only will they be invited, they are indirectly learning the prayer and they're learning the parts of the prayer too. Um, so they're, they're absorbing all of that. Exactly. And I found that, um, you know, slowly my child stopped doing that where he would climb on top of me. And he knew that as soon as I would say my salam, that's when I'm done because he learned that because I was saying it out loud and I continuously do that. And uh, now we're at the stage where Alhamdulillah, he is, you know, doing the parts of the prayer. You know, obviously he's just imitating me right at this point. Right. Yeah. Um, but we've gotten from, you know, climbing on top of me to imitating. And I found that if I simply turn the TV on or if I said, go away, he wouldn't have that opportunity to, to actually learn on his own. Right. No, I'm not so sure. Sit down and say, watch me pray or let's read a book about prayer. I'm letting him do what he needs to do to absorb it in the way that he is most comfortable doing and in the way that I'm not interrupting. Right. And it's a test for me too, because you have to focus on your prayer, but you know, um, that's, that's life, you know, like uh, the prophet used to pray in battlefields. So mm -hmm. I think we can pray. We can try to pray with a child climbing on top of us. Right. And, and the thing is, is that a lot of parents, they wait, they, they put their child away from the prayer. Like they put them to sleep so that they can focus on their prayer or they give them to another sibling to occupy them or they don't take them to the mosque. You know, they drop them off at the grandparents' house and then go to the mosque. So a lot of uh, parents do that. And then when their child is over, uh, older, now they have to introduce the prayer to their child. And they're like, how do we introduce the prayer to our children? But actually, if from the day that they're born, your child is already part of the prayer, they're already experiencing it in their environment. It's part of their life experience it's very natural that they will want to pray. It's yeah. very natural. I mean, with my, with my own son, um, you know, I never, you know, I never kind of, you know, as he got older, I never kind of said, right now you have to pray. I mean, I remember this was something I asked, seek, I sought advice from a sheikh and I asked him, you know, what do we do? You know, do we actually like make our children pray or do we, um, you know, give them space and they will naturally do it. And he said to me, pray in his environment, pray. Let him see you. Let it be a nice experience. And guaranteed, he will come and he will pray. And what was really beautiful is that, you know, at quite a young age, he just decided that he wanted to do all of his prayers. And I've seen, I've heard this from so many families who haven't imposed the prayer on the child, but instead they've, they've allowed their child to be part of the prayer from a young age. And their children will pray sometimes even with a stronger conviction than the adult you know <laughs> their, their children will pray all of their prayers and they will cry when you don't wake them up for bedroom <laughs> you know I've, I've seen this with so many families so that's the key thing you know like you said you know we call the adhan in their ears the moment of birth and then we need to let prayer be part of their environment mm -hmm. you know constantly so that they're having that life experience because life experience is what's going to impact your child the most it's the life experience that he's going to absorb that are going to become part of his personality and when it comes to ramadan with those lengthy night prayers we don't need to be in we don't need to pressurize ourselves to be um you know doing you know sometimes mothers will try their best to do all of the tarawih or to read all of the quran actually that's not always supposed to do you know yes we should aim for it and we should try our best 
but we have to do it with our child because our role is nurturing this next generation and we only get one shot at it right you don't you know you can't wind back time and then you know raise your child again we only get one shot at raising this next generation of uh you know minim you know so we need to uh do our ramadan with our child mm -hmm. with our child so that you know everything else will unfold naturally so that's really beautiful. We've spoken a lot about prayer. Tell us about some other things that you're doing with your son, um, some other life experiences he's having that's connected to Ramadan. Definitely. Um, so one big thing, which I'm sure a lot of people are also doing, is um, preparing the food, preparing the iftar. Uh, my child obviously is not waking up for suhoor because he's two and a half, right? Come on. But I mean, uh, although some kids will wake up. One day, yeah. I'm like, go back to sleep. <laughs> But, um, but, you know, uh, preparing the iftar is so big in our home. And what's nice is you can integrate your culture into this. You can, you know, um, we're actually doing a Ramadan around the world. Yeah, um, yeah. Just do check out Nadia's account because she's been hosting this Ramadan around the world, which is really exciting and beautiful to see because I think a lot of people don't realize that, you know, Islam is our religion and it's kind of like our blueprint of how to live. But with every culture, there's a different way that we do it, right? And it makes Islam so beautiful because across the world, you can see so many different uh, ways of, uh, you know, of, you know, in celebrating Ramadan or integrating Ramadan into life. So many different ways. So I love those um, hosts that you're doing at the moment. So do make sure you check out her page and check their stories out because they're really interesting. Anyway, go ahead. So, uh, yeah, so uh, making sure you um, try and integrate uh, them, making iftar, um, and, and that's where your practical life comes in, right? So everything from, like, his favorite thing to do is making, we have this thing called fruit chat. It's like a South Asian thing. Uh, and it's great for cutting, so we cut the fruits into very, very, very small pieces, uh, mix it all up, and then, you know, put on your, your, all of your masalas and everything. And he loves the mixing process and taste testing. And it's actually good because they can taste test for you because we can't do that. Lovely. Yeah, yeah. They're actually beneficial. <laughs> yeah. And it's all that practical life and then all that sensory experience because one story tells us that the child between zero to six is a sensory explorer. So they're getting all of that exploration with their senses. Definitely. And then I'm sure you're bringing in the language. Yes. you know with the naming the fruits and everything and even that preparation involves mathematics because you're estimating and making judgment and mixing and you know so it's so beautiful to involve your children in food preparation mm -hmm, definitely and then of course you know the fact that we're sitting down on the table he'll help um because you know obviously like when it's not ramadan sometimes you don't make a big deal out of when you eat but in ramadan it's a very particular thing that it's it's our time you know like we're all yes. hungry so so and, and because of Ramadan, I didn't even have this before. We actually have a um, sure to show you. We finally got an Adhan clock. It's sort of up there, and I was like, this is this is actually important because he needs to understand that this is the time to break our fast and pray right afterwards. So um, we ask him that okay, you you tell us when it's time to break our fast. We all go to the table. We sit down. He sits down with us. Um, setting the table is huge. He loves doing that. Um, and then uh, clean up, clean up is also big. You know, he's, he's sort of getting used to that, filling the, dish, filling the dishwasher. All those things are just part of the things you can do in home to sort of involve your child. Um, even just helping us in when we're actually getting ready to then pray, he'll take out all of our prayer mats, especially if my parents are over, he'll help them with that. Um, so those are some things that we do in the kitchen. Um, and then I would say, we actually, unfortunately, were in the middle of COVID. so. We can't really, you know, go to our masjid. Um, but what's interesting is that he's seeing us go to go to the drive-through iftars. So we actually have this thing where you can take your car and then you can uh, pick up food and give a donation and then leave. So he's really curious as to why the masjid is closed, and it's sort of hard to explain to him why it's closed. But um, what he does see is people giving us food and us giving donations. So that's where you can sort of integrate the idea of charity, um, you know, um, helping your child understand that, you know, the masjid itself is a place where you can give donations and then you can drop off food there. You can get your child to create, you know, um, boxes and you, can, and you can actually go to the grocery store. There's actually a grocery store near me. It's, an, it's actually owned by a Pakistani family and they have 
these um, shelves of pre-made uh, bags that you can you can buy and then you can drop it off directly to the masjid, which I think is amazing because the wow. it's actually child's reach. Mm -hmm. They can grab it, they can see what's inside of it, then they can pay for it, then they can drop it off. So it's not too big that they can't carry. It's like about this big, which I think is so adorable. Um, so getting your child involved in, in in donating and raising funds and you know collecting food, I think is so important. My my son loves going grocery shopping, so this is perfect for him. Um, and, um, you know, just dropping food off to your friends and family, I think is so important. Uh, we have a, a, a friend who doesn't, who lives pretty close to us and we can't really interact much with her, but we'll always make it a habit of dropping food off to each other's houses. Um, so he's involved in that process. I always give him the, the little bin and I say, auntie now, and then he'll give it and then he'll receive something in return. Um, so again, that, that idea of sharing your food and um and giving is so important that a two and a half year old can definitely i feel understand that yeah, yeah. Which is beautiful yeah. i think that charitable aspect of ramadan is also another thing that we can bring into the child's life experience like you've mentioned and i think it's really important because you know like we said ramadan is one of those 12 months where we develop all these good habits you know to care for other people who are needy or you know, people who are sick or, you know, whatever it may be to, to, to really become aware of those people and then to give and for, you know, to give for those people and to experience a little of what they might be going through, you know, the hardship that they might be going through. Um, and, you know, giving your child those life experiences are so beneficial and it will integrate into his personality. And, you know, before COVID, we could, you know, we could actually go and hand to those children, the ones who are in need, or we could go to an orphanage and hand to the children, or we could find people on the street and, you know, homeless people and give them food. Of course, we can't do that now, but it's really beautiful that those, uh, there are opportunities in the mosques or in, you know, the local uh, places for charities. There are opportunities that we can bring our child and show them. And, you know, it's really easy to do everything online. Like it's so easy to give charity online, right? But we need to tr remember that the child needs a life experience so that it can become part of them so that they can absorb it. So just like you said, is, you know, going out, you know, buying the things and doing our best to show the child that we're giving this away you know, that is the experience that they're going to absorb. And then it will become a part of them to be charitable. It will become a part of them to be considerate of others. It will become a natural part of them that when they see somebody in need to lend their hand, to give from what they have. And Ramadan, you know, it really bring highlights to us, you know, are we doing enough charity? You know, are we helping enough those that are in need? You know, Ramadan is like the reminder to always kind of bring us back to, are we doing enough to help everybody? You know, because one of the things about the Montessori philosophy is the, is the idea of our cosmic um, interconnections, that each one of us are interconnected. Mm -hmm. You know, what happens to one person is going to impact you in one way or another. You know, we are all an interconnected unit. She talks of us about human being being one unit, one, you know, we are united. So, you know, monastery education is all about, you know, allowing the child to naturally see that interconnection and become aware of it gradually as they get older to become aware of it. And then to also know how, what to do, what's your cosmic task? What is your part in this interconnected web of life? What is your part? And in Ramadan, we can really bring that to the forefront. We can really bring that aspect of interconnectedness we can really bring to the forefront what our cosmic task is and what our purpose is and and show the child in many many ways how we can uh you know be of support to others and sometimes it will be things like giving charity and you know getting food and helping the homeless or visiting somebody who's sick Although maybe right now you can't visit people who are sick, but you can definitely Zoom them and still make them smile, right? You can have a Zoom meeting with them. Um, but uh, also the simple things like, you know, knowing that smiling definitely. at your friend is a charity. You know, this is what the Prophet told us. Smiling is a charity. Smiling at each other or, you know, helping each other or, you know, just being positive, just being positive and loving in the environment that we're in. This is a form of charity, you know? So Ramadan kind of brings us all back to that kind of state of who should we be? 
and what is our role in this world and what's our connection you know you're miles and miles away from from me i'm all the way in asia and you're all the way in north america we're like you know miles away from each other but we're also connected you know where there's an there's an interconnectedness and um letting our children begin to see that every year we have this month that we can come back to the meaning of life and come back to that interconnectedness and begin to develop those habits that we should be doing for the whole year. So it's not about, you know, in Ramadan, you pray lots, you read Quran, you do charity, and then after Ramadan, you just go back to how you were before. No, I mean, the, the true measurement of whether you've been successful in Ramadan is whether you come out Ramadan changed. <laughs> Right? This is your opportunity to change. And we want to see our children actively seeing us change ourselves, you know, yeah. actively seeing us setting goals and changing ourselves to become better parents. You know, they'll, they'll absorb the energy of us doing it. And, and through our conversations with them, you know, they will absorb that that's the habit of Ramadan. The habit of Ramadan is purifying yourself, changing yourself, becoming a better person. And, you know, all of these small examples that we've been given uh, in, in the life today are, um, you know, showing us that it's, it's not that hard, actually. It doesn't cost a lot of money, you know. It doesn't cost a lot of money. It's not that hard. It's all about going back to the spiritual preparation of the adult and the prepared environment, right, and ensuring that the child is having those life experiences. For sure. Definitely. Well, for sure. And... And just again, like the prophet said himself that like he, he would set an example through his actions, you know, more so than his words. It was, it was, it was all through his actions. Right. And again, like just as you mentioned, simple things. So we were at the playground actually just yesterday and, you know, just out of the blue, like my child, he allowed a whole bunch of kids to just go in front of him in the playground. And I, and I asked him why. And then he said, Oh, um, it's theirs. It's their it's actually their playground. And what, what was happening was we were actually doing this thing with a few friends of mine where we were, um, I was giving some of his old toys away, the things that he wasn't playing with and, you know, and, and they would also give some things in return, but he didn't really see that part. It was just, he was just seeing us giving that, okay, we're going to, we're now done with it. So now we're going to give, we're going to give. So whether it's connected to that or not, I'm not quite sure, but the, re but the, the point is, is that, he took the time and the patience to say, okay, you know what? I can see that they're, they, they really, really want to go on the playground. I'm going to let them go. And then I'll go later on, right? And when I was giving away his toys, he said, you know, it's okay. It's theirs. I'm done. It's theirs. And he kept saying that. So it's just that idea of not being so attached to things either, right? Uh, we're getting them involved at a very young age and, and, and really having those deep conversations that, okay, this is something that doesn't, necessarily belong to you this belongs to allah you know so you're done using it you've you've gotten your use out of it now let's give it to someone else right so you know something like charity and, and and understanding poverty may be a little bit too advanced for young children sometimes so bring it down to a level that they can understand something like their 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 materials their toys or letting them letting that child have a turn first at the playground right so this is something also to encourage in Ramadan and then hopefully can be translated to after Ramadan, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Lovely. And bringing in that whole thing of, you know, love for yourself, what you love for others, right? Mm -hmm. You know, in Ramadan, we want to give what we love and what we enjoy to others so that they can love and they can enjoy. And actually the, the pleasure that you get out of giving something you love to somebody and seeing them happy is often much better than the pleasure you get from doing that thing yourself, right? So exactly. through that experience that you've given your son, he's getting to see a, a much higher level of happiness that's achievable when you, when you give, when you give to somebody. And, you know, Ramadan really brings us, it really highlights that for us. It really brings us all back for us. And of course, we know that, um, that our reward with Allah is multiplied in Ramadan, right? We know that any good deed that we do, it's like the incentive that Allah gives us to change ourselves, right? You know, and not that we should only do it for the reward, but it's like an incentive to kind of pull us in to do as much as we can in this month and then keep that as part of our character and part of our lifestyle for the rest of our lives. So if, if our children experience Ramadan like that, 
if that's how we're being and that's the environment that we're creating and that's the energy that we're creating with Ramadan, then imagine how they will grow and what they will do when they're adults. That Ramadan will be a constant reminder, you know, that 12th of every year will be an opportunity to always reconnect them, to step up to another level, to become a much better person, to further themselves, you know? And that's what we want to create. We want to create that environment that the child is gonna absorb. You know, it's only through their absorption that they're going to transform. So we want to, them to absorb it. You know, we really have to capitalize. From zero to six, the child is absorbing everything. It's like a tape recorder. Everything is being recorded and stored and it's gonna become who they are in the future. So we want to capitalize on that absorbent mind and it's not through making card materials and it's not through, you know, sitting down and, you know, kind of giving a lesson about Ramadan, but it's through life experiences. That's the most rich thing that we can offer our children, you know? And I think uh, there are a few people who joined us who are also um, have older children with elementary stage right so if you don't mind i'm just gonna take one minute to say a few things about the elementary child so we know that like zero to six the child is absorbing and then from six to twelve the child now has a rational mind uh, a reasoning mind and they have this powerful imagination and they're really interested in um, the social aspects of life so we want to capitalize on that you know the child is they have this uh, reasoning mind so they're ready to learn the fic of ramadan they're ready to learn the details of Ramadan, you know, what breaks your fast, what doesn't break your fast, you know, what, how many uh, prayers you need to do now and how many prayers here and the whole story of the prayer or the whole kind of like nuzzle of the Quran and, you know, the, 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 you know, the, uh, you know, the different significance of, of the, the days in Ramadan, you know, it's when your child is in elementary, that's when we can begin giving those uh, lessons about those things for the child because they've got that mind that is curious that's asking the why that wants to get to the bottom of it right so we give them those lessons uh, and i found that children in the elementary stage are so closely connected to, um, and ready to learn fic right but we have to give it to them at their level they're ready to learn fic so all of those aspects of fic to do with ramadan you have to leave that for the elementary years it's not necessary to bring that in earlier if your child asks questions earlier, like how many, you know, rakas do we pray? Then you can just tell them simply it's four or it's five or it's this or that. But it's, it's when they come to the elementary stage that we really have to begin. Uh, we can give them those lessons. And this fits in with what the prophet told us, you know, about, you know, play with your child for seven, then teach them for seven. So it kind of comes in there because Allah's given them the mind that's ready for it, that, that, that reasoning thinking mind. And then the child has this great imagination. And we feed their imagination through stories, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is where you bring in the stories about uh, the great Muslims, the, the historical stories about Ramadan. There's so many great history things that happened in Ramadan, right? We bring in the stories about the prophets and the first Ramadan that they've had. And, you know, all of that, we bring in all those stories so that your child is now in this elementary stage. They're forming this deep cosmic knowledge yeah. of what Ramadan is all about. You know, so that's kind of how we approach Ramadan in, in our school and how I approached it with my son. And um, one of uh, the traditions that I did in my own home in elementary years was to always make Ramadan the Sira time as well. I mean, we always do Sira, but we really emphasized that Ramadan was like the Sira storytelling time where we constantly had the, the stories of the Prophet from, from the beginning of Ramadan to the end to try and cover the seerah of the prophet. So that in that month of Ramadan, it's coming back to that perfect example of a human being, coming back to the life of the most beloved one by constantly bringing the child to the seerah. So we made that a tradition. And I know that for my son, when it comes to Ramadan, there's always this kind of like, uh, he gets this kind of feel of sira, you know, <laughs> because it was so interconnected. But that's one way that you can really feed the, uh, the imagination of the elementary child and you can feed that reasoning mind is through giving that fake of what you can eat, what you can't eat, when you can, when you can't, you know, how to tell the, the moon, how to tell the sun, how to, right. you know, like all of that. And also the history, you know, that's the key thing. So, so you know it don't pressurize yourself to bring that in in the early years you know 
The earliest, they need the experience because they're absorbing. And the experience comes from how you are and the environment you create. And it's once the child gets to about six, seven, that's when you start to give those lessons. And it's much more effective because the elementary child has the highest level of intellect in life. You know, his intellect is processing the highest. So all of those lessons you give them, they will just take it in so seamlessly. Um, So that's kind of how we approach Ramadan. Um, using the kind of the Montessori planes of development, using the Montessori philosophy. Go ahead. It's actually interesting you actually mentioned that. Like you were talking about the moon and the phases of the moon and everything. And I find that a lot of people are, you know, and of course you, you, you go based on your child, right? Like my child himself is very interested in the moon. You know, like he, he, he looks up at it and, and, and he wonders about it. He tries to search for it. And to be quite honest with you, I did integrate an activity to do with the moon but to be perfectly honest he's not ready you know i don't find he's ready for that you know like i i i created it we actually created like a little moon cycle and everything and i just don't think he's ready for that you know like i would rather him and it's funny at, at this age it's better that they experience things in real life it's better to yes, take ex- definitely better yes to let- definitely and say look up at the moon you are you're showing me you want to see the actual moon we'll just stick with that i don't have definitely. to pre- like, well, for you, you're two and a half. Like, how much can you truly absorb at that age, right? So that, that may be controversial. I don't know. Maybe other parents find that it's effective. I mean, I mean th- there's no harm in, in doing an activity if your child wants to. There's no harm. But you yeah. have to remember that, that they're, at, they're in that absorbent mind stage. And they're going to, it's like we're giving them a taster. Yeah. You know? We want to... They, they see the moon, they're interested in the moon. We want to give them the life experience before we give them the card experience. You know, that's what I keep telling myself, the life experience before the material experience, you know? So they love the moon. They're interested in the moon. Brilliant. You know, bring them out to see the moon. You know, you can, you can bring out a material about the moon. There's nothing wrong with that. But you know that it's, it's a taster. Exactly. And it's, it's, it has to be backed up with life experience. Yes. That's the first thing. So it has to, don't, forget about sighting the moon and just focus on the cards. That's the wrong way to go to it. We're not supposed to turn all of these experiences into a lesson or into a learning, you know, so-called learning experience. The child is learning anyway, right? But we're supposed to, you know, allow them to have those experiences. So the child is interested in the moon. Make sure you're giving them plenty of opportunity to sight the moon. Exactly. You know, and you can chart the moon. They can draw the moon. You can talk about the moon. You can you can be showing them that you are looking for the moon or whatever it may be. You can bring out some cards and they might be interested, but it's a taster. But it's in the elementary years that now the child is not only interested in the moon, but they're interested in understanding how it works and why it works. And, you know, who put it there and why is it there? And you can really go into the cosmic part of it. You know, you can really bring in, you know, that Allah created the earth, Allah created the moon and the moon rotates, you know, rotates around the earth. And, you know, you know, you can talk about the sun and the distance of the, the earth to the sun and how Allah put it perfectly and how we use the moon to, to tell us, you know, the calendar, the months and everything and how, how incredible it is that Allah's put us, put this moon there so that we know where we are, you know, sorry, I keep that, so that we know where we are in the year, you know, so, you know. All of that is what comes in the elementary stage, you know? And just one last thing I just wanted to say about the moon was um, I found this amazing book. Honestly, I I haven't even heard about this much. I just happened to stumble upon it. Someone told me it's, uh, I don't know if it's backward, but it says, but who is Allah? And it's such a beautiful book for, for a child of my age, especially where it starts off with a boy who notices the moon. And that's how the conversation starts, where he says, wow, what is this? He goes in and asks his parents, who made it? Because children are always wondering, my child at least, everything right now, he's saying, who made this? Who made this? And my answer is always Allah, right? <laughs> um, so it's just a beautiful book that sort of talks about the moon, but then puts it into a context. You know, it's not just the phases. It's, you know, he created the moon, and then he also created, and then he brushes his teeth. He goes downstairs, he has breakfast. Who created my food? You know, and then you and then you talk about gratitude. Then you talk about um, playing with your toys. He goes outside and he plays with a kite. Who created my kite? Who created the sky? So it's really um, honing in on the curiosity of a child. That's what it literally says on the back. It says Adam was really curious about Allah. 
So I just found this book to be really fascinating. This is literally my child in a book right now. Um, so that that goes really beautiful with that quote that you read from Montessori. Um, you know, where it's it's innately within the child that connection to God. It's there. They recognize it. You know, we know as Muslims that before we came to this world, you know, we were all um, souls. You know, and we already testified to Allah's existence. So. So we know that we've already had an existence. It's the fitra within us and it's within the child. It's not that they don't know. Sometimes people ask me, how can I introduce God to my child? I'm like, you don't have to introduce God to your child. Your child is more connected to God than you are, darling. You know, you just need to allow them to continue in that, you know, natural connection that they have. You know, don't interfere in the wrong way. You know, don't interfere. Don't force it. Don't push it. You know, just create the environment that it's going to allow them to flow in that. They will teach you. The child will teach you. You know, you will become closer to your God through your child. Exactly. You know, you will become more aware of what you need to change in yourself through your child. Right? Mm -hmm. So don't, it's not that you need to introduce God. They're, they're, they've already got a connection to God. And that's why all these beautiful questions come out. You know, like in that book, these beautiful questions come out. And a child shows us that even from a young age, they, they, want to, they want to be connecting to God. They want to be hearing God. They want to hear us talk about God, you know, time and time again. Because in this, in this dunya that we're in, it's this, this world is the material world, uh, realm, right? It's the um, material sensory realm that we're living in. And the whole purpose behind this realm is to connect us to God. You know, the whole purpose behind everything that's around us is to connect and connect us to him. And that's what Allah tells us. You know, he didn't create us except that we worship him, except that we find him, except that we recognize him and we connect to him. And that's what this world is all about. That's our, that's the cosmic uh, plan. That's the cosmic interconnection. And that's our cosmic purpose, our cosmic task, right? So the child is seeking that from birth. They're seeking that. You know, it's just that we don't recognize it sometimes because we're so caught up in a, another way of living, this very materialistic way of living that we're in now, which, you know, nowadays we have so many amazing things like Instagram where we can connect like right now <laughs> we can talk and have these lovely conversations. But at the same time, we have these other things, you know, that can take us away from that spiritual development. So we need to balance it. And the child needs those life experiences. The young child needs those life experiences. And that is what would have happened at the time of the Prophet. And that's what would have happened at the time of the Sahabas. The children would be living Ramadan alongside their families, alongside their communities, alongside the Prophet. They'd be living Ramadan. And they'd be actively seeing the adults around them transform in Ramadan. And that would then you know, be absorbed and become integrated in their personality. And then they would grow up to be those people that no matter where they went in the world, no matter how far they traveled, when it came to Ramadan, this is a time of improving yourself. This is a time of giving gratitude, giving shukur for all the amazing things that we, we experience and we have. And this is a time of being charitable and connecting and realizing that interconnectedness between us and each and every person and every living thing around us so that we can give back, give from what we have and what we love and what we enjoy, give back to others, you know? So it's been so beautiful talking to you, Nadia. That was <laughs> so a beautiful. beautiful. Can we just like get some likes for Nathema? Because that was just like the beautiful <laughs> summary of everything we just talked about right now. <laughs> no, no, no. It was, it's so beautiful talking to you. And, you know, I really love how you've, Sorry. Um, no, no. Uh, you know, we are in the last 10 days of Ramadan and yeah. some of us may feel like, oh, wow, I didn't do, I didn't do much of that at all. Right. But the reality is that we're in the last 10 days of Ramadan. This is the time that we should be putting in more effort. And if we didn't do it, then it's okay. You know, like we, we can do it now. You know, we have so much to look forward to. And so take those last 10 days to just improve whatever it is you want to improve make those goals make those changes within yourself you are the prepared environment first and foremost uh and then inshallah you'll see those differences within your child and also take the opportunity to think about how you're going to plan your eid right um you know are, are you going to integrate some non-materialistic aspects into your eid i remember one time i when i was going to the masjid you know way back um 
I remember I saw this little girl. She was probably two and a half, three years old. She was going around giving um, little bags of candy to like all the children. I thought that was adorable, you know, like for a child, for children, usually they're just, you know, I want my candy, you know, but this child was going around the entire masjid just giving these little kids candy. I thought it was adorable. Um, so what are you going to do on Eid to make that an experience that they can then continue their, the teachings that they learned and the, and the behaviors and the characteristics they learned in, in, in Ramadan. So even if it's going to your neighbors and dropping off food or even just going to your neighbors and saying hello, you know, if you haven't seen them in a long time doing something on Eid that continues what you've done on Ramadan. Yes, definitely. Toys or, you know, maybe dropping off food or dropping off toys to a toy, toy drive. Or, you know, again, as what you mentioned, I really like what you mentioned earlier about choosing a toy that they really, really love and then um, getting them to give that toy to someone else and seeing your child's reaction. You might be surprised. They might feel even more joyous than having, the toy, than having that same toy for themselves. So there's still a lot to look forward to, last 20 days of Ramadan and Eid. So yeah. So we need to make the most of it. And we need to remember that any effort we put in as mothers or fathers, because there might be fathers listening to this. So any effort that we put in, in as parents to kind of help our child absorb that Ramadan and help it become part of their integrated personality, even when it's hard, you know, even when you're tired at night and you're trying to pray and you've got your baby crying and you've got your children running all over the place and jumping on you and, and you're frustrated because you just want time to read Quran or you just want to pray, you know, you know, remembering that every, every effort you put into your children, it's a sadakan jariya. You know, every effort you put into your children is recorded with Allah. You know, it's recorded by its intention. It's not about whether you're successful or not. It's not about whether you've successfully, you know, allowed your child to absorb it. It's about the effort and the intention that goes behind it. So every effort you put is recorded by Allah. And because it's Ramadan, it's multiplied. You know, when you, when you are patient and when you are, you know, going through that hardship with your children and you're finding it difficult because you're fasting and you're tired and you want to drink and you've still got to, you know, look after your children. You've still got to make food for them. You've still got to, you know, pray at nighttime. And, you, you know, a lot of parents get really tired at the last 10 days of Ramadan. And I know I do, you know, even though I don't have young children, I get tired in the last days of Ramadan. But like remembering that Allah is watching. Mm -hmm. The angels are recording. And that effort is being recorded. And you will be rewarded for it by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will reward you. And it's not just going to be the normal reward you get throughout the rest of the year. It's multiplied. You know, it's like you did it so many more times. So taking these last 10 days, making sure that you include your child so that they can have this life experience. Remember that the child right now today in this moment is absorbing what is going on around them and they are creating the adult they're going to become. So remember, your child is creating that future adult that's going to be there in 20, 30 years time. So knowing, being conscious of that and then doing your effort, even when it's hard, having the right intention, doing your effort so that you can aid your child to develop into this beautiful human being who realizes their connection to others around them realizes the purpose of their life, realizes the purpose of Ramadan and can be it in the future. You have to know that Allah is watching you and the angels are recording and you are being rewarded. And that is Ramadan as a parent. That is the parenting of Ramadan. And it's difficult, but at the same time, it's the most rewarding. You know, it's the most rewarding. So keep that in mind, you know. You know, we're in the last 10 days of Ramadan. Do the best you can. Keep that in mind and never think it's too late. Just like you said, Nadia, it's not too late. You know, just take it on board now and you will see the difference. And you might not see the difference now when your child is small, but you see the difference when they're 20, 30 years time. Inshallah, you see the difference when they become the adults because they've absorbed all of this. Well, we can see a perfect example in your son as well. You know, so if you're feeling like, I don't know if this is going to work, we have a beautiful example right over here. I think, yeah, I think with, with, um, you know, with my son, it's been really beautiful to see. I mean, I, I was a Montessori teacher before he's just coming in right now to show me his exam papers. Cause he's got his, um, he's got his <laughs> maths exam this week. This is IGCC maths exam. I'll see it later. <laughs> 
<laughs> so uh, when he, I was a Montessori teacher before I had it, but when I took my Montessori training, they didn't bring in all of that spirituality, the spiritual preparation of the adult. And so some of this, I, I really, you know, connected some of these dots later yeah. on in, 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 um, in his life. Um, but the, the bit that I did do had such a huge impact in him. Mm -hmm. so that's what we need to remember and that's what we you know we need to really do our best it's never too late to start you know it's yeah. never too late to start and you know come on the last 10 days of Ramadan I hope everyone is excited and ready <laughs> you know? the, the best 10 days of your life you know of your year the best 10 days of your year and if we get it right in these 10 days then inshallah it will be smooth for the rest of the year until the next Ramadan comes to remind us again of what we need to to improve on in ourselves for sure definitely so thank you so much nadia it's been absolutely lovely to have you for life it's thank been for really nice may allow mm -hmm. her for even you know thinking of the idea of doing this and and you yourself were feeling like i don't know is it too late to do this but based on all of the comments and everything and I, I don't think it's too late at all. So this was a really good idea and I'm really glad we got to speak about this and share some of our reflections and from two very different perspectives too, you know, like. Yeah, I mean, you have a toddler, I've got a teen, you're in the US, I'm in, um, you know, uh, Malaysia, you know, different <laughs> cultural backgrounds, different, you know, so many things, right? So, but yeah. it's, we're all connected with one, right? <laughs> so it's really beautiful. I'm going to be saving this in my stories. So we'll save it in the story, uh, in the IGTV, and then we'll be sharing them in the story. So don't worry, because I know there's a lot of people who've messaged me with like tearful emojis saying that they can't make it because they're either in Tarawih or, you know, they're breaking their fast or whatever it is. So we know that Ramadan is like a difficult time. And I try to make it late. Like it's, all, it's like 11.15 now here in Malaysia. So I try to make it late so that at least, you know, more people can join. Um, but don't worry, if you haven't joined it, we haven't managed to catch all of this from the beginning. I'm going to save it in my IGTV. I'll share it in my stories. I'll share it on my main account, Rumi Montessori. And I'm sure that Nadia will be sharing it. Oh, and yes. please, 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 if you're listening and you love this live and you have any comments or anything you want to add or anything you want to share, please put it in the comments because we can keep this discussion going in the comments, right? So put them in the comments and please share it with anybody that you think will be interesting. And just before we end, please make dua for us. Please make dua for me, make dua for all of us that inshallah, it's not just that we're talking about this, but we can be it and we can implement it and we can come out of this month of Ramadan transformed and we can help inshallah, the future generation to come out of Ramadan transformed with a greater level of awareness and a greater level of the connection to all that's around us. So please remember us in your dua, everybody, in these special 10 days. Thank you so much, Nadia. I'm excited to have some more lovely conversations with you. Yes, definitely. Inshallah. Anything you want to say before I end the live? Um, Ramadan Mubarak. <laughs> Ramadan Mubarak. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Okay. Take um, care. <laughs> Sorry, I missed that last that time. I'm in Montessori on. Don't worry about it. You know, the more simple. Don't worry. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Thank you. Ramadan Mubarak, everybody. And good night for those of you in Malaysia. And good morning for those of you on Nadia's side of the planet. <laughs> so, okay then. Take care. Assalamu alaikum.